some of the, our discussions that we had in the previous uh, weeks when we were not talking about the topic uh, of today, which is what well, which involves digital transformation, uh, but also collective intelligence. You've probably already heard me saying something about uh, collective intelligence. Um, my, my, my talk to you today will be uh, my explanation to myself of how I came up to uh, studying collective intelligence as uh, for at least for the, the last four or five years, my major topic uh, of interest. Uh, some colleague asked me that uh, a few years ago in a conference and I was there stuttering and I didn't know how I got to collective intelligence. And then I started for me, uh, tr trying to understand how I got to this topic. Uh, and of course, as I got to this explanation afterwards, it may already be my own representation of how things happen. Uh, it may not be necessarily what happened, but it's something that makes sense to me. And, uh, and, and so I think that uh, my talk on digital transformation and uh, collective intelligence uh, today has two main purposes. One of them is we will pro I'll probably show you that uh, digital transformation that became a buzzword in recent years is something that has been happening at least until the 90s. And of course, the 90s was when I started uh, studying uh, information systems. Uh, Professor uh, Nicolau may even argue that it was before that. And in fact, I, I, I got contact with many papers written in the 80s that already sort of pointed out towards the direction uh, uh, that we're going today, or at least that most people see today as, as being uh, digital transformation. So is digital transformation something new? Is it, is it just a, something that is happening now? Uh, I, I, we cannot argue against the, the, the fact that the, the, the pandemic definitely allowed that many companies that were, let's say, um, a little resistant to digital transformation to either digitally transform or get finally out of the market, uh, even some 20 or 30 years after that was already being announced by those who thought of digital transformation uh, still in the 20th century. So one of our, of our, our topics here, uh, it, it's a side topic because what I really want to talk is about collective intelligence, but it will explain uh, why collective intelligence became uh, such a fascinating uh, topic uh, of study to me as a researcher, uh, because it made sense of uh, many of the possibilities of the digital transformation that were already being announced uh, uh, for so many years and, 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 and mentioned as being uh, the, the best strategic approaches that organizations could take in order to benefit from uh, the information technology that was uh, available to, to them. Uh, one very beautiful thing, I think, about collective intelligence is the way that Pierre Lévy uh, defines it uh, when he claims that every single human being in this planet knows something that nobody else knows. And if that's true, and, and I believe it's true for the same reasons I believe that each one of you, when you read a paper, you get a different impression because you have your own experiences and your, your own... Uh, uh, the, the track that took you to reading that paper was a completely different track than the one that took others there. Uh, so if each one of us knows something that others don't, it is important to mankind, it's important to humanity that we share this knowledge and that we benefit from the knowledge that each one of us uh, has uh, about a, a specific topic that others don't. Right? Uh, is this what we are seeing lately with the use that we make of technology? Possibly not. Uh, I mean, after 2000, the, the, the 2016 elections in the United States and, uh, and whatever happening in other parts of the world, including Brazil after that, we see that uh, although uh, our information technologies allow us all to talk much more than we did in the, in the past, to express our ideas and our opinions much more than we, we did in the past, uh, we still do it in a way in which we want to impose our views to others, right? Uh, and uh, do it sometimes using the most, um, uh, maybe the, 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 the least beautiful aspects of uh, humanity, uh, fake news, uh, becoming uh, absolutely polarized in our ideas, uh, being sure about our opinions uh, and completely, completely resistant to facts. So there's, there's definitely a lot that we have to do to turn the dream of collective intelligence, the dream in which each one of us can support the whole with their own uh, knowledge in the topics that they are, they are, they are knowledgeable and uh, at the same time be smart enough to listen to others uh, with respect to things that others know better. We still have to develop, I believe, technology that helps us better do that or that prevents us to have 
uh, collective stupi stupidity ruling over collective intelligence. Um, yeah, so we, we, we need technology, but we also need, and I, I think that maybe it's not, uh, it's not, not so technological. It's, it's also a matter of us understanding for so long, we did not have a voice. When we were given uh, a, let's say, a, a megaphone, it's, it's not just a speaker, it's a, it's a, or, or a microphone, it's a megaphone. When they gave each one of us a megaphone, we are all screaming and we don't listen to, to the others. So I think there is some social learning that we need to do collectively also, uh, so that we can develop uh, uh, collective intelligence as something that will take mankind uh, even further than uh, we, we have been able to, to, to come up to today. Right. Uh, again, I want to go back there to, to, to our uh, Moodle page because I included there uh, three papers and they are all papers from the uh, 90s, as I told you, because I thought most of what we claim to be digital transformation these days was already being uh, uh, preached uh, by uh, authors of the 1990s in our information systems uh, community. Uh, these three papers are just examples of the way digital transformation was already there, as uh, at least as an indication of where we could go from where we were at that stage. Uh, but uh, but they, they they also show I think that they they show where collective intel intelligence came from, or at least uh, they already the, the, all those authors already acknowledged that there was knowledge to be captured from others than uh, just uh, those. Uh, the, the employees or those who worked directly for companies. Of course, in the, the in the nineties, information systems was very um, organization, uh, very focused on the organizations. I mean, you have to think that we we spent that whole decade trying to fight against the the idea of the productivity paradox. Right. Uh, of course, uh, companies were spending a lot of money uh, in technology, and at the same time, they were not uh, getting the results, or at least the results were not uh, expressing themselves. In the financial, at least in the in, in a financial manner, manner that would convince not only um, the the finance the the, 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 the finance uh, departments of uh, the organizations themselves, but also economists. I mean, we even had uh, Solo, for example, a Nobel Prize uh, in economics, saying that computers were everywhere except then uh, in the productivity, uh, uh, you know, uh, assessment of organizations. So we spent a lot of time uh, having to to struggle against that kind of ideas, uh, but uh, 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 together with that, we were already saying, okay, if, but, but, but if there is a, a way in which you want to turn uh, information technology into results that will be measurable, even using those uh, metrics that were possibly defined to measure other things, um, that will happen if we turn IS or, or information technology into a strategic um, instrument uh, for the organizations, and, and these authors were all uh, thinking of that. And I will tell, I will show you that they were all thinking of ways of involving uh, the customers, the suppliers, other people that were not the employees in building value for the organization, or at least building value that the organization could share with its customers, which ends up being the same, right? If you build more value, that means that the company can uh, ask for a higher price for the product, and the, the, the and the company, uh, sorry, the customer will still perceive that as a good uh, business uh, proposition because uh, whatever the, the, the company brings to, to the customer is uh, perceived as valuable. Um, so, well, I, I don't want this to be a complete uh, monologue. Uh, so feel free to interrupt me at any time uh, during you know my, my talk here. But at the same time, I can assure you that we'll have plenty of uh, opportunity to discuss it uh, after I quickly show you the ideas of this, the, these three authors. Uh, or, or sorry, the, these three papers, and try to first prove to you that the, the, the digital transformation was already around at least since the 80s, sorry, since the 90s, and that at least these authors that I'm mentioning here were already thinking of uh, collective intelligence, because uh, uh, although they never mentioned collective intelligence in their texts, but you will see some of these guys were not even mentioning the internet. I mean, we're talking here about uh, papers that were written uh, uh, all of the all, all of the papers that I will be discussing here with you uh, were papers that were written uh, at least a couple of years before Google was around, right? And and maybe for some of our students here, they 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 probably will think was the world possible before Google? What was the great oracle people 
you know, when, when they did not, not know the answer to, their, to, the, to their, sim their simplest questions when Google was not around. Well, Google was not around until 1999, which means that these guys here uh, were writing about where we would be today and even in the future, but they were doing that from a perspective of someone who, 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 were, uh, who had as an environment uh, information systems that were still much simpler than anything that we have today. Okay. Uh, well, the first one of those, uh, and, and, and by the way, I mentioned that these guys were all talking about involving the customers or involving um, the supplier, their suppliers uh, with their companies in ways that they could become more productive, in ways that they could build more value. Uh, and they were all also providing, uh, let's say, food for thought that allowed it, uh, other uh, important movements uh, to happen related to innovation, for example, in the early um, uh, 2000s. For example, open inno innovation uh, with uh, Professor Chasbro there in Berkeley and, and, and so many others uh, discussing the possibility of companies, instead of uh, having huge research and development uh, departments, relying on the expertise of uh, outsiders, of, 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 of it's, it's not only uh, customers or suppliers, it's also people from the crowds. Uh, that was an idea that was able to flourish early in the 2000, 2004, I believe, uh, was when uh, uh, Chesbro first coined the, the term open innovation, uh, because of the, what, what these guys were already showing us that it was possible, uh, again, at least in the 90s. Uh, uh, I, I would like to, to know maybe Nicola, Nicola can uh, tell us later uh, uh, how, how far those who, who, who were studying uh, information systems from a strategic perspective uh, were from, from what I'm arguing here already in the 80s, right? Because I, I mean, there, there were many companies doing some beautiful things uh, in the 80s that maybe were already involving, trying to involve customers and, and suppliers and others in building knowledge for the organization. Well, uh, in this paper here, Real, Real Strategies for Virtual Organizing by Venka Truman and Henderson, they, uh, uh, I mean, it, it's interesting because they were telling us organizations will become virtual in the future, right? Uh, and of course, they will have to strategize for that. They will have to develop um, new strategies that benefit from this. It's not, it, it, uh, they didn't see this as just a possibility. They, they saw it as the way to go. And they, they thought that they, they, they built a model uh, that had three different uh, vectors, uh, one of them pointing out to how to interact with customers, the other one how to interact with the suppliers, and the other one how to gather knowledge out of that. I would very quickly try to find this model here. Uh, one beautiful thing about papers written by Venka Truman and Henderson, and I was a real fan of these guys, and I was never able to do the same in my own work, was that they, they, they write a whole paper, and then they usually have at least one figure that summarizes the whole paper. So even for those of you, the students should have read, I told you at least one of the three papers, right? But even for someone who, who didn't read the paper, if you come to the, to, to the figure, uh, to, to, to this picture, uh, you will understand what the whole paper was about. So here are the three vectors. Well, it looks a little, uh, a little strange here, but it's the three vectors for them were customer interaction, which they also uh, named a virtual encounter with the customer. So it was instead of being physically face-to-face -face with their customers, they, they were already considering this possibility of interacting with their customers through, by means of their technology, uh, asset configuration or virtual sourcing. Uh, I was telling you, this is looking downstream. If, if you think from a, an operations management perspective, uh, or in operations management, we, we look at the, the whole value chain or the whole, the, in, in operations management, they call it supply chain, right? We look to, uh, to the whole supply chain and we see whatever, company or organization is uh, towards the direction of the customers, you call it, uh, you say it's downstream. And uh, those companies that are towards the, the, the suppliers and the raw materials, if we think of an industry, for example, in a manufacturing plant, those are upstream. So what I'm say, seeing here is that this first vector, customer interaction is how the, the way that a company could think of using information systems to strategically improve the way it related to the customers and to the customers of the customers, right? Or uh, I mean, uh, uh, it, it's a downstream strategy. Asset configuration is uh, quite the opposite. It, it, it was when they were thinking how they could better organize the, their production uh, um, instruments or their, their production uh, processes and, and whatever, uh, which involve things that are done inside the organization directly, but it also involves, and, uh, and IT was already potentially very important in, in allowing that to happen, 
also uh, allowing companies to outsource a lot of uh, of their of the work to partners or to suppliers that would supply them with uh, usually with modules uh, or at least with parts of their products or with part of what was necessary to build um, anything that was valuable to, to customers afterwards. So uh, the second vector here uh, is uh, what uh, I would say that it, it is the, the, the thinking of how to become digital, uh, looking uh, upstream or towards your suppliers and also thinking which uh, processes uh, were developed inside the organization, but maybe would more reasonably be outsourced to suppliers. So when they think about asset configuration, the assets could belong to the organization itself, but they could also belong to partners or to suppliers, uh, which would free the organization from uh, having to decide their future strategies based on the assets that they already had. Uh, most of the idea back then, and, and I, I think this is still something that happens with organizations today, they prefer many times not to commit to, to, to any assets that uh, may be important now, uh, but may not be important in the future. And, and, and when that's necessary, they prefer to uh, maybe find uh, a supplier that, has, that, that is already committed with, that, with those kinds of assets uh, because that makes it more easily um, possible to change in the future. Uh, I, I usually say that we, we become slaves of the decisions that we have already taken. If you buy an apartment, uh, well, I'm here in, in, in Curitiba, in the south of Brazil. I was going to give an example. If you buy an apartment at the beach, which is about 100 kilometers from where I, I am now, if I buy, buy an apartment in Guaratuba, which is one of the beaches in my states, that means that decision uh, will reduce the, the decisions that I can take in the future. Uh, I will possibly spend my holidays for the next 20 years or so in Guaratuba and not elsewhere in the world, right? So not committing to that, to, to, to purchasing that specific asset allows me to, to, to experience different possibilities in the future. And many companies find that interesting because that allows them to become more flexible to the changes in the environment, right? Not all companies will follow uh, Kodak's um, uh, vision, or uh, sorry, mission of, I remember that Kodak had and I even had that uh, uh, a print a print out of that. It had its mission said uh, we we develop or, or we we produce our products from the four elements of nature. And they refer to the the Greeks there that well it was water, uh, earth, uh, air, and fire. Right? They say in, in other words they said all oh, asset configuration for Kodak was we. We, we are owners of uh, them all, right? We, if you think that something is important for our process, we will buy it. And by the way, they were able to, because they were the owners of the silver mines or many silver mines in the world, they actually reduced competition in the film market uh, for many years uh, based on that. But at the same time, when film uh, stopped being film and became bits, uh, electronic bits, um, Kodak, had nothing to do. I mean, they had already bought their apartment in Guaratuba, right? They could, they, 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 they had their silver mines. They would have to insist in the idea that film would always be made out of silver. Uh, and it's not just the film itself. I think it's it's one of the components that is used to develop film or whatever. But anyway, you you, you possibly got the message there. Uh, so these guys were saying asset configuration can be much different if you use information technology because you can relate to your suppliers and 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 in a way that they will be perceived as part of the organization, right? Uh, a customer will not be able to tell which part of the product was developed or made by you and which part was developed by uh, a, a supplier. It doesn't matter. They, they, they only have access to, to the final products. Uh, and then finally, the third vector here is a, 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 a knowledge leverage vector, which again relates. So notice that uh, when we're thinking about the way you relate to customers and the way you relate to your suppliers, uh, they, they don't put a lot of emphasis uh, here on at least on this paper on you uh, acquiring uh, you, you know you, you're acquiring knowledge well, well actually they do you know because it's it's the third uh, it's the third vector here uh, uh, they're, 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 they're when they're talking about vector one and vector two they're mentioning how they believe that uh, the technologies could lead to a virtual to, to, to a strategy for a virtual world uh, for a world in which companies would uh, deal with um, you know, using using the the, the, the technologies that, that that information uh, information technology that was be, becoming available to to them, uh, they, when they're discussing the first two vectors, they don't mention as much the fact that 
uh, one of the main gains that you get from interacting directly with your customers and, and, and connecting your suppliers in a way that they become almost as if they were part of your organization is that you acquire a lot of knowledge from these guys. Right? Uh, you acquire a lot of lo knowledge uh, that uh, was not knowledge that you had inside your organization. You reach out to the, the knowledge of your customers and, and think when, you, when your customers are the retailers or are the ones that contact the, the direct, the, the, the end customer, uh, they know a lot that you don't know. Pierre Lévy is there, right? Pierre Lévy uh, tells you there is something that someone else knows and you don't know. A retailer knows the market for a company's products uh, many times better than the company itself because the retailer is there face to face with uh, the, the end customer or the customer. The, and, and, and the customer tells the retailer, it doesn't tell the manufacturer. I'm thinking, I'm, I'm giving here more industrial manufacturing examples, but of course, this applies also to service organizations, or in, as a matter of fact, to any sort of organization. Uh, the, this, this idea that whoever is there close to the, the customer knows the customer better than you do, right? Uh, and so, so they also had this third vector here that was, we want to make sure that we use technology to capture knowledge that is generated in the, and I haven't mentioned yet, uh, in the several stages of uh, each one of these actors. Uh, I will not get into the, the, the details of the, the, the stages here. Uh, 25 years later, I believe that we could possibly even rename some of these stages. I, I'm sure that the authors themselves would think of different names, for example, for customer communities, uh, resource coalitions here, Maybe they would think of a, a, a different name that would be better understandable to, to us today. But basically what they, they, they meant by resource coalitions, coalitions were, was a situation in which we as customers, or, or in fact, if a Martian uh, stopped their flying sauce here on Earth and looked at an organization uh, or at, a, 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 at how those assets were configured, they would not be able to tell which people belonged or worked for each company. They would all be working uh, uh, seamlessly uh, on, uh, on, on, on projects that it, it would seem as just one organization, when in fact it was a set of different organizations working to the, together. So the resource coalition would be the, the extreme to which uh, we would, uh, or the, the extreme that we would reach when uh, independent, uh, independent organizations working on uh, 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 interdependent processes uh, would uh, work so perfectly well that we would not notice that they were independent. Notice I'm talking about inter uh, independent organizations working in interdependent processes. So the process depends. What one company does uh, depends on what the other is doing, even in terms of time, because you know, with all these uh, notions of just in time, uh, 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 the product, that, uh, the module, let's say that one of the organizations is producing has to arrive to its partner at the right time to be attached to the, the module that the other uh, um, party is, is working on. So we need interdependence, but we need interdependent, interdependence among independent partners. That's when we reach the resource coalition. Of course, to reach, uh, uh, to be able to, to get there, we have to start from, and, and, and I think that this is, is still so beautiful today. You know, it's still such a, a clear way for an organization in 2021 uh, to organize its, its let's say it's, uh, uh, logistics and its, its operation, uh, that it's almost unbelievable, unbelievable to me that uh, we, we talk these days about digital transformation about uh, as being something so new, and these guys were all saying this uh, so many years ago. Uh, sourcing modules, the idea of, 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 of having a modular product. By the way, uh, Nico, when Nicholas Carr, uh, uh, sorry, um, it's not Nicholas Carr. Uh, oh, gee. Nicholas Carr is the, the IT doesn't matter guy. Uh, I forgot his name. Well, when, when, when this author in operations management, uh, Star, uh, Martin Star, when Martin Star in the 1960s uh, was discussing modularizing products, uh, he was already thinking of modularizing products uh, not the same way as the Industrial Revolution did to make sure that uh, each, uh, each worker would, would do part of the work and you would still have uh, the, uh, the, 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 at the end, you would have a complete product. Uh, Martin Starr was already thinking about these possibilities of dynamic cost customization in the 60s, right? What he was thinking was that uh, modules, if, if a product was modular, it would allow customers to first tell what they wanted, and then companies would put those modules together to provide that customer with, uh, 
with a dynamically customized product. Of course, when we have, when, nowadays it's very, this is very clear, uh, customize, uh, 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 dynamic custom, customization is what happens when we get to a website, for example, and configure a product so that it becomes uh, exactly what we, uh, what we want. By the way, let me show you something that uh, has been around at least since, uh, well, the early 2000s, Nike, Nike.com. Uh, Nike has, and I, I haven't been to this site very often lately, so I hope that I can still find it. Nike had this possibility for you to customize products. Using that idea that I was showing you in Venkatraman and Henderson's uh, paper of uh, dynamic, it's, it's dynamic customization, right? I will be, uh, well, I'll, I'll tell here that I want a man's shoes. Uh, and of course, they will show me, they will provide me with a few platforms. They don't want me to, it's customization is different to personalization, so it's not going to be from scratch, they will probably give me some ideas, uh, and uh, maybe this this one looks traditional enough to me. Uh, uh, oh, hang on, so I just clicked on. I'm not sure if I clicked on the customize button. No, yeah, I, I do have the customize here, um, and then it allows me to do all these different things to the product. Notice it's the customer. Think of the first factor, right? Provide the customer with the virtual experience uh, with the product. I hope this loads. Uh, uh, provide provide a customer with with a, with this uh, virtual experience, allowing for customer um, uh, dynamic customization. Which means uh, it's only because I have you watching me do this that this thing seems it's not going to work. Let me try and and go back here. Uh, well, uh, let, uh, I, I think I came to a, a previous page. So this is let's say this is uh, the first first level uh, first level of the first vector. Um, uh, it, it allows me to have a remote experience with the product. Look, I can see it from different angles, right? But here it's first, first, first level of the first vector, right? And then uh, if I try uh, pause, now now I missed the customization thing. Uh, let's see here. I can uh, let let me see the tongue. Oh, I see. I'll, I'll change the color of the tongue, right? I'll have it orange. Now now you see what I mean. Uh, okay, let me go to another item here it, it allows me to change 16 or to configure 16 different things this is the lining i think it's the let me have it in yellow oh no so that's something different that's i, I thought I, I thought it was the uh, the strings uh tongue uh, i don't know what this is oh well, this, this is if i want it in leather pat, patent leather or whatever let's have it in leather and it's going to be gray uh doesn't seem to be leather now, but anyway uh what else do i have here back tab uh, satin twill, I don't know what that is, but it notice that it changed there. Uh, I, I can configure all these thing, different things. Uh, what is vamp? I don't know, but let me, oh, this part here in the front. I can configure everything. And the, 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 the interesting thing about this is that after I, I've done all the configuration and I paid with my credit card for the products, it's, it's, uh, uh, they converted what used to be a build to stock thing, right? You, you, you build or you, you, you manufacture the product and you send to stock. They converted it into a build to order, right? They, they will only start producing that product when I ask uh, and when I pay. I didn't pay, so I don't think that it, it will go to their data set. But if I had paid for those shoes, right, even if they thought that I was a little color blind, that I have a really poor taste for color, right? Uh, even if they did not agree that this was the best possible combination, uh, that this was still my uh, contribution to collective intelligence in the way that if I'm paying for that, there may be other people in the world that have uh, the same taste as I do. And in fact, that's when statistics gets uh, in, in, in place, right? And if, if 30 people, I don't know the, the, 30, the, the, the number 30 magic there, if 30 people have chosen to mix yellow and red, they will say, well, there's some color pattern there that our specialists, our research, let's say all the people in our departments uh, do not, uh, see, Andres is, is saying that Nike ID has been around since 1999. Right. So why are we talking about uh, uh, digital transformation these days? Come on, these guys were doing digital transformation back then. We could be talking now about uh, lag behind digital transformation, desperate digital transformation for those who who, who didn't do it uh, uh, as soon as they could. Uh, but again, uh, notice that my buying a pair of tennis shoes provides Nike with a lot of information. Uh, this dynamic customization in which I was involved provides them with a lot of information that can help them even better 
design products for their traditional lines, for those that are going to be built to stock and will eventually appear in the department stores where other people with a taste like mine are going to go there and find these beautiful shoes uh, in, in, in those patterns of colors, yellow, red, and orange all together, right? Uh, and they will, uh, 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 and that, that's the, 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 the again the, the collective intelligence of the customer being brought uh, to the development of new products, right? And this is something that was already possible uh, since the 90s, riskier then for sure. I mean, you depended on a lot more technology that was being introduced uh, at that stage, uh, but uh, possible uh, at least uh, since. Since that stage, well, so this is uh, uh, so this model for me is digital. No, notice it's a digital transformation model. Uh, the authors didn't call it. They could have here yeah, real strategies for digital transformation. That was not the buzzword of the day, right? Uh, they didn't have the, that buzzword, but that's exactly what they were doing. Uh, uh, and they could also have said the uh, real strategies for digital transformation based on collective intelligence. Or maybe if they wanted to use a different uh, expression for that, based on the wisdom of crowds. There will be a crowd of Alex's uh, around the world designing their own shoes, buying their shoes from Nike using Nike. Uh, it used to be Nike ID. Now it's, it doesn't, doesn't show as Nike ID any longer. Uh, but using the possibility of, uh, of dynamic customization and providing the, the company with information that their own designers would not be as good as in order to, 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 to provide it. Open innovation was already here, right? Do you agree with me? Um, so this was uh, uh, the, the first paper. I know that a few of the, the, the students uh, read this paper. I don't know if uh, anyone, uh, I, I've given you my impression, and it's, it's an impression about this paper that has been formatted over time. So I, I've read this paper so many times over the last 20 something years. Uh, and uh, my opinion about some of the things that the guys say there was reinforced reading after reading. Others have changed over time because it was not, maybe I, I didn't have, I, I either didn't have their capability of having the same vision, uh, or maybe I have a different vision from what they had at that stage. So, so th th there have been changes, but I know that a few of, uh, uh, of the students that have read this, in this paper, and I, I'd like to know what, what were your impressions about it? Andrea, go ahead. Hi, so uh, I, I'd like just to add that the Nike ID strategy it was designed before the digital revolution and stuff. It was a feature in store. So people would uh, go to the store and uh, customize the trainers with the color they wanted and everything. And the shoe would be made in store. Like it, it was very crafty. It was a very like analogic thing. And of course, Nike being Nike, they saw a great opportunity, and as time went by, they evolved to transform Nike ID into Nike for you, by you, and transforming it in a, in a very successful and profitable uh, digital product. So, so you, that's what you're Nike. telling me there, uh, Andrea, that's is Nike. that collective intelligence happened before digital transformation in this case. They, they already believed, they already, Nike already believed in collective intelligence before they had the, the, the means to perform the digital transformation. Well, I don't know if they actually were thinking about uh, collective information, about gathering collective information, since the, the shoes were made like by, uh, they, they used to call them artists. So they would just press the shoe. I don't know what they did with the information they, they gathered, but possibly, I mean, I mean. There is a chance that they were wasting that information. Of course, we, we, we would have to research further on that. Uh, I, I would bet that they already being the company that they are, yes. they were not throwing that information away. I, I, in fact, I, yes. I, I think that even today, dynamically customizing tennis shoes, probably, probably, and, and, and this is absolutely a guess, I don't have uh, the information, but I think it still costs more than what they charge. Yes, I, I think that everything that is, is, is customized, and then after Nike began to, to have some successful and create buzz for the brand, many, many brands started to follow them. Mm -hmm. Like they, they set a trend. And then collective intelligence playing their uh, yeah. its role again, right? Uh, even when we're copying, when we're mimicking others, that Absolutely. means one and month, then, this and other then month. Burberry, Prada, Adidas, of course, and everybody. I, I mean, lots of different brands with different products uh, began to sort of start to try to customize stuff. Although, um, like most of them didn't succeed as Nike did, because Nike, Nike by you is 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 successful. But still, this is probably something that we could investigate further. Yeah. When I say that I'm not sure if it's profitable 
directly profitable. Of course, it is very profitable in the sense okay. of, uh, of uh, how do you call it? Yeah, uh, um, market research, right? Yes, yes, of course. One thing I, I usually discuss with, with uh, my students is market research used to be going to the street with a folder and with a pencil or a pen and a, and a, and a piece of paper and, and asking people questions. And people were afraid of, I mean, people were, when, when they saw someone with, uh, you know, a pen or a pencil, asking, would, you, would you like to, could, could you answer me a few questions? They would say, no, I'm, it, I'm in a hurry. It hasn't changed. It hasn't changed. It's the same. People so it's the same. away that, from research. That's where, Andrea, I think that Nike was already doing collective yeah, intelligence in a right. smart way because they were saying, okay, what, what I was doing right now with this pair of shoes was I was being interviewed by Nike. They were, was asking me, would you prefer these tennis shoes? The I don't remember the names of this, the, the specific names in English, but would you prefer this part of the tennis shoes in this color or that color? In this uh, fabric or that fabric? Uh, they were asking me questions and I was there answering very patiently for half an hour. And, pay, pay. and pay a lot of money for it. And if they could segment like by age, by gender, by country, I mean, this is pure gold. This is what every brand needs and wants, I mean. But again, I, I, I would argue that the pure gold there is the data. Yes, data, of course, segmentation. Uh, segmentation. Because when you, I don't know if you paid attention to the price of the, the, the tennis shoes that I was uh, buying there. Has it, anyone know? I think it was $110 or something. I, I don't remember. I think that's what I saw. $110 is the price you're going to pay for, a, for nine tennis shoes in a retail uh, store as well. So they're not charging you more. Of course, the tennis shoes that you buy uh, to order will never be in a discount shop, right? So you will never buy, you know that in the United States, you're able to buy Nike tennis shoes for $30, but they're in a basket, it's the last one, and they won't get rid of that, right? Uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, that, that, 110, it's the cheapest one. Yeah, so, so uh, uh, but anyway, uh, uh, what I'm saying is that's that's the price that you would see in a retail shop as well. Yeah. The only, the, 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 there, are, there are two differences here. They may be paying in the sense that uh, it may cost them $200, and they're still allowing you to, to pay only $110 because you're spending half an hour <laughs> yeah. filling their questionnaire, right? True. And, and if they had to, 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 to invite <laughs> you to do that on the street, maybe they would have to pay more for it. And so, then you will post your Nike made exactly. by you on Instagram and you get likes and then people are going to visit Nike by you and they're going to make their own shoes. So. Exactly, all of that. <laughs> uh, all right, well, thank you. Anyone else had imp uh, who, who read this paper has any impressions to share? Silvio, go ahead. I was thinking about my business because I work with uh, retail, uh, specifically with construction products. And when we start to analyze the customer uh, relationship with the store, we try to, to get the information. But it really, who has the information about the customer? The salesperson mm -hmm. in his personal phone. So the collective intelligence, uh, you think that you have all the information, but you have to, to, to think about the whole uh, people involved in this process. Yeah. Oh. Well, and, and one thing here, when I'm trying to collect to, to relate these two things, is that collective intelligence yeah. from an organization's point of view, it, it requires that third vector. Uh, yeah. So it, it requires that you use technology also to develop or, or to retain the knowledge. Yeah. Right? Uh, in fact, in a in a in a regular traditional uh, retailer, what happens is that, for example, if I go to a retailer and want to buy tennis shoes, I would wish I could buy. Uh, if in, in, in Brazil, we have the numbers are a little different, uh, but anyway, uh, 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 for number 42 for my right foot and number 41 for my left foot. That would be my, in fact, I don't know if, if Nike uh, still allows you to do that, but at some stage it allowed you to have different, uh, different, uh, have different sizes. But even if I, if I went there and I said, I want whatever modo, uh, and they say, sorry, it's out of stock. Yeah. I, would, when, I would go out of the shop and uh, that information would not be traceable. The only one who would possibly know it is the clerk uh, or, or the, 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 that seller directly that he would say, well, gee, there's, there's some demand for some shoe that we don't have in stock, but that would not go to a system. Yeah. Even I read the, the, the paper, the paper is uh, was in 1998. Mm -hmm. I think it is still can you use it uh, in my business, for example, nowadays. <laughs> it's incredible. You know, one thing, <laughs> I, I, I hardly ever give my students any paper that is less than 10 years old because many times I cannot tell if that is going to be uh, still valid next year, but something that has been valid since the 90s, I can tell you, be sure, this is still a good idea. You can still use this. This is the digital transformation that, that people are now talking about because of COVID that you could have been doing since the 90s. You, you had examples of this, this authors here. Uh, they're, they're not, the, the paper that I'm showing here, none of them is a really academic paper in the sense that it was written to the academic peers. They were all written. This, this one is in uh, law management, I think, right? Uh, 
uh, slow management review, right? Slow management review, Harvard Business Review. These are journals uh, where academians uh, write to business people already, right? right totally uh, totally so totally this was information that was already available. Uh, what prevented people from using this kind of mindset back then? Uh, well, uh, Kuhn would say that uh, a whole generation has to die before uh, people with, with, with new ideas uh, can take over. Uh, it's not only that, of course, uh, it, it was risky. Um, it involved uh, te te technology is usually, and, and new technology is usually expensive because people don't know about it. Uh, that, that's that, that's something uh, with respect to knowledge, right? Uh, you, you pay for it because you don't have it. After you have it, it's simple. Uh, this is in fact one of the reasons why we professors are so poorly paid because we do not we don't value the, the knowledge that we already have. Uh, if we didn't have it, we would value it. <laughs> uh, when we have it, we think, well, it's not worth much. But see, these guys were already telling us how to 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 go on uh, see, uh, from that stage. All right. Uh, anyone else? I don't know if there's any other hands up or just open your mics when you when you feel. Free. I'll, I'll I'll just go to uh, our second paper here. Uh, Makena, uh, he was one of those uh, marketing gurus. Um, I mean, much before the 90s, he was already a marketing guru. And in the 90s, he had uh, already perceived that marketing was not going to be the same as it was in the past. Uh, this is an, a 1995 paper. I also have here a, well, maybe I have to, to change here so that you see. I also have here a, a book by him that is from 1999. Uh, the title is almost the same. And the content is an expansion of some of the ideas that are in this paper, real time. Uh, in the real time, uh, uh, marketing paper, basically what uh, McKenna was doing was giving Venka Truman and Henderson reasons to, do, to, to include the, the first vector here, right? Uh, McKenna is talking about the first vector, customer interaction, and he is saying there is no reason why companies should push their products into the market or convince people to buy what they, they produce. It's better that they go there and learn from the customers what the customers need or what the customers customers want, and then build products that are that already fit those needs and wishes. Okay, he doesn't mention collective intelligence here at any moment. Uh, and of course, when I read this the first time, maybe in, well, I started my master's program in '96, so I, I I'm not sure exactly when I read this paper for the first time. Possibly in '96, so one year after it was it was published. Uh, I was not thinking uh, uh, of this as collective intelligence, but it it, it is collective intelligence in the, in the sense that he's saying. You know, you have uh, the main the main argument of the paper is build a dialogue with your customers. Use the new technologies that are available to make sure that customers talk to you. And and when he mentions you, it's really your systems, right? Because uh, he's uh, he's preaching here to even to companies that have millions of customers. And of course, if you tell uh, a company that has millions of customers, build a dialogue with your with your customers, uh, an old, old mind would possibly think, does that mean that I have to also have millions of employees so that they can chat with people, uh, with our customers and build this dialogue. No, the idea was to build a dialogue among the company, uh, sorry, among the, the, the customers and the company systems. I think that Nike was already going in that way, uh, although, uh, and, and we never know. I'm not say, telling you that uh, Nike um, executives were reading Makina, but these were ideas that were flowing, that were being discussed in academia in, in the 90s, right? Uh, I'm sure that many of Nike executives went to good MBA programs where uh, uh, papers like these were being discussed. And at the same time, I'm not saying that it was Mr. Makina proposing something and then uh, the industry uh, using that. It was uh, most probably the other way around, right? Uh, some clever executives were starting developing this uh, use of technology to build a dialogue with customers. And Makina, uh, after observing that, decided to report it to others and say, look, there is, there is a, another possibility of using technology here in a way that uh, we, we can provide additional evidence that it's not only the product productivity, or that IT doesn't produce only the productivity paradox. It also produces sometimes new businesses. And, and when you're measuring the old business, yeah, it's going down, but it's because there's something else happening instead, right? So building the dialogue here is, um, I think it, 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 it is the, the main uh, concept uh, in uh, in Makina's paper. I think he, in this paper, the whole paper, it's, it's a, well, it's a, it, it says it's a nine page paper here. I thought it was shorter, but anyway, uh, I think it's only five or six pages, but anyway, uh, I think he, the, the, the word internet only appears in the text once or twice. Of course, it was at the real beginning. The 90s were, uh, and, and maybe the, the first half of the 90s, 
was when the, the organizations were first taking account of the existence of the internet. Up to the end of the 80s, uh, it was something that uh, was only used at universities and well, you probably know better than I do the history of uh, the internet. But I remember that in 1990, I was still uh, uh, an undergrad student uh, and I was uh, finishing my, my undergraduate project. We had my, my university, I was a student at uh, UTFPR, at the Technological Federal de Paraná as well. Uh, and we had this uh, collaboration program uh, with a university in Germany. I went there to, to spend a year and, uh, and do my final um, TCC, Trabalho de Conclusão de Curso, the, the, I don't know how to say that in English, but it's basically the, the, the end uh, work of the, the, the course uh, in, in, in Germany. Uh, and uh, I remember that a few days before I went, a colleague of mine came to me and gave me a little piece of uh, paper with instructions of how to get to, at that stage I think it was called BitNet. Uh, BitNet was, it, it was part of the internet already, but yeah, I had a list of instructions and, and that saved my life because in 1990, spending a, a year in Germany would have been horrible if I did not have BitNet to talk to this friend of mine at the university here. And then he would, uh, uh, on weekends, he would take my message to my parents uh, and they, they would know about me. So notice, I'm, I'm talking about 1990. Makina is writing this paper in 95. So five years later, uh, notice the difficulties in communication that we had in the, in the early 90s. And he was already saying, use technology to build, uh, to, to build on your relationship with customers and to involve customers in several different uh, activities related to, to, to the organization, including, but not only, the development of the product. Uh, he mentions uh, 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 the, the development of, of the product itself, but also marketing of the product. Uh, I think this is something that Andrea was mentioning when, when the customer gets involved with something, uh, he or she has the desire to express that. And, uh, at that stage, Makina had no idea of, of, of the, the social networks, the electronic social networks that we would have these days, but uh, uh, he was probably already thinking of this possibility of people sharing in their in the electronic means of the time, uh, sharing with friends, so becoming the marketers of products that they were uh, developing as well. Um, yeah, Aurora, right, go on. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to argue that um, I, I had the opportunity also to, 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 to use BitNet. Uh, mm -hmm. at the beginning and i wanted to to tell you that what business mean, means because it is time to network it will okay. network oh. so the, you maybe you didn't know that but that's no. the reason it's got business and then it is, was 1981 when it started around and it was so futuristic because uh, he realized that it was time to network mm -hmm. well so it, it took me 10 years to to get to it but uh, but I, but i got you know <laughs> yeah that's that's it, a, it was a, that was a that was a, 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 a first you know in, in in Chile it was 1980 I think it was 1989 something because uh, we were studying a, a pilot study using uh, my university with the United States in Illinois. I remember. Okay, so, so doing that in 1990, I was not that far behind, but, no, but yeah, I remember it was it was a script. The first the first yeah. network and it was this uh, was the name it was um it was very interesting because it is because it's this time to network. Mm interesting and, and of course we, we uh, that's, uh, who's paying for this because i i told him how, how it, was a, it, was no. a, it was a the the, the united the university of yale or some on somebody else i think mm -hmm. it was Starbucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it worked. Uh, uh, so, but my it's, idea it's there, I was thank, no. But thank you very much for that information. And my idea was to say that, that we have to put this, the ideas of these guys in perspective, right? Because I mean, it's it's easy for us to read a paper twenty five years later and 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 say, gee, this guy only mentioned the internet twice. Or well, think the internet was had been there then for five years because uh, five years before this paper and, and a paper that was published in, in ninety five was written in ninety four or ninety three, right? And in nineteen ninety. Uh, well, of course, I was a student then, but the possibility that I had was using so before it's time to, how, how do you call it? Before it starts, it's time to... Because it is time to network. Be because it's time to network, yeah. So uh, I, I networked 10 years after they started the project in Yale, yeah. but still was probably one of the first to use that in my university because exactly. we, we were at the, the computing school, so we were we were the, the nerds there. And exactly. anyway... Uh, all right, so this is the idea of, of, of McKenna's uh, uh, paper. Again, uh, when when he mentions that we should build a dialogue, I mean, we build dialogues because we we, we think we, we let's say we are we are all very selfish, right? In in uh, humans are, are 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 an interesting bunch. We are we're selfish people with we, we we practice altruism for for selfish reasons. So we build dialogues because we think that whoever's at the other side has something to tell us. Okay. Uh, I don't, I don't know if my argument was very good here, but anyway, uh, uh, I mean, we, we usually build dialogues with people we think that have interesting stories to tell us. And McKenna was already saying, there is intelligence at the other side, you know, the customer, 
is intelligent, intelli intelligent, and we should capture that intelligence by means of building a dialogue. Where we don't want to impose things on them. We want to understand what their needs and wishes are. That was a concept that was already very uh, strong in marketing in general, right? Marketing came up with this idea that it's not only advertising, um, but it's also understanding. So I'd say marketing from, not exactly from its right beginnings, I think it started more like an advertisement, but it soon realized uh, that it needed to, to build dialogue. Uh, what happened here was that McKenna was acknowledging that information technology could be the tool for this digital transformation, for this uh, business transformation at that stage, business transformation, but, but a digital transformation in the sense that it would allow this dialogue to happen uh, in a way that millions of people could talk to the, to the company's system. And then, of course, people, uh, the company would process that, would make a sense. And this is something we're starting to do better now that we have all this data science tools to, to help us organize all the data that we, the, the, all, all the, the knowledge that we, we, we actually call, collect data. That's, that's probably it's still a problem, right? We, we collect data and we, we try to turn that into knowledge afterwards uh, in, this, in this sense. Right. Anything else about uh, real-time marketing? I know that there, was, there were a couple of people that read that paper also. If you want to just tell us what you thought of it. If not, I will, uh, I will go straight to, to the third paper and, and, and insist with uh, the students that uh, uh, I wish you can, uh, that, that for the, the, the other seminars, that you always read at least one of the papers. By the way, for next week, there's only one uh, paper to re be, be read in, in advance so that you can uh, discuss with, the, with, the, with our speaker. Right? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about that. Uh, so, all right, uh, and and then the, the the third paper that I brought to you, and, and notice that I'm more doing the advertisement of, of the papers than anything else. But this is again uh, a paper that, as Silvio said, with respect to the other paper, that there the, the, the were things that could still be used today. Well, I would say that all these uh, uh, ideas from the '90s could and should be not still used. They they they, they could be used and, and should have been used for much longer uh, because they really can provide an edge. Uh, to 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 organizations. Go on, Silvio. No, I, when I I was reading the uh, the paper about Dell, I checked the the model, the business model. Actually, it's almost the same. It's almost the same. It is. It is. It is. Uh, <laughs> Some it, years ago, I don't know, twenty years after that, no. <laughs> uh, uh, well, well, but but Dell's but Dell's model was probably more the inspiration. You know, it's not that Dell again. It's, it was not Dell that went there and read these guys. You know, Dell. Is a practitioner. He's, he's in practice, and you know that people in industry have little time to pay attention to what we are doing in academia. Uh, again, this this is great material for students because uh, what Dell perceived in the in, still in the eighties when he founded Dell in eighty five was that uh, it did not make sense to put a computer together and then put it in a shelf. Uh, of a retailer to sell, and then the, the whoever wanted to buy would say, "Well, but I wanted a larger monitor, or I wanted a more memory, or I wanted a a processor that could deal with uh, graphics better than that one." The product was already modular, for other reasons, not for the reasons that uh, Henderson and Ben Katzman discussed in their paper. They were modular for the same reasons of the, the industrial revolution, right? It's you you build modules and and then you put them uh, together. In fact, they, they 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 already had some part of the second vector. Of Encatrimon and Henderson here, asset configuration, because when IBM uh, developed or designed um, the the PC, it designed it to be modular because it did not want to have the burden to develop all, all its parts. It says, "I will build the interfaces, I will uh, design the interfaces, and and then I will allow collective intelligence to happen." Right, in the sense that other companies would will think of boards that they can stick into the computer. Remember the the, the desktop computers that they had those um, slots. Or you could stick a board. I remember that I had uh, uh, in, in, in 1990, uh, I bought in Germany because we didn't have that in Brazil yet. I bought a sound blaster uh, board, which was a board that allowed my, comp my, my PC to do more than just beeps. Uh, it could actually uh, perform other sounds. Uh, and that was not something that was designed by IBM. Uh, having designed the PC as a modular product, it allowed the other uh, companies to, to, to build parts, which made it possible to have process interdependence, right? Different companies, each one of them building uh, different parts. None of the other manufacturers ever got to resource collision. I think Dell was the one who, who, who did get to resource collision around 1998, around this time that, where, where he gave the, the, the interview, uh, because Dell was a much smaller company that was beating IBM, uh, Compaq, and HP that were the main 
manufacturers of uh, PCs at the time. Uh, and, and it's not that nobody understood how they were doing that. Everyone understood IBM uh, and Compaq and HP. The problem was that they had all their, their you know, they, they were committed to assets. They were committed to a process of selling through retailer uh, retailing shops that uh, made it difficult for them to work the same way as Dell did. But Dell is an example of this, the same way as I said that uh, McKenna's paper is a beautiful example of uh, how to develop this vector one of uh, Venkat Truman and Henderson's uh, model. Dell is an example of how to build vector two uh, with all the possibilities of uh, also getting information from the customers and therefore building on vector three as well. Uh, Michael Dell, when he, well, in, and in this interview, it becomes very clear that he was able to, or his company was able to get so much information from the end customer because it sold directly to the end customer, right? IBM, Compaq, and Dell uh, all sold through retailers. Uh, Dell sold directly. Because they sold directly, they had that uh, collective intelligence of all customers, each customer telling Dell what they needed. And in fact, already by means of some dynamic customization, even if it was happening through uh, telephone lines, because when in 85, when Dell started, the way to interact with, with the end customer was through those 0800 lines, right? It was telephone, uh, but they were talking to, so the same way as Andrea was mentioning that Levi, uh, sorry, not Levi's, uh, Nike was was doing Nike ID before they had the technology to, to do it online. Uh, Dell was already developing its uh, direct sales uh, or its direct model before it had the internet technology available to, to his company. And by doing that, he, uh, his company was able to get much more information from customers, but also his company was very close in this this uh, paper, this this interview with uh, Michael Dell here, done by uh, Magreta, who was uh, at that stage uh, at, uh, well, this is a Harvard Business Review paper, uh, uh, shows uh, he, he was also able to learn a lot from his suppliers, uh, suppliers of modules, and work as a real resource uh, coalition, uh, which never happened to some of the other uh, participants in this uh, market. And uh, of course, um, uh, Dell today is not what it used to be in terms of uh, PC selling. In fact, no one is because nobody nobody buys PCs, the, the desktops any longer. Uh, the mod model that was uh, discussed with Dell here in this interview was a, the model that they used for desktops. Desktops, because they were such modular products, right? Uh, they were very good for asset configuration, but they were also very good for dynamic customization. When the world went towards um, Notebooks, notebooks are not as modular, right? At least not from the, the perspective of, of the user. It's it's more difficult to do dynamic customization here. Uh, and uh, and at the same time, uh, well, uh, also, and, and together with uh, notebooks, uh, uh, I think uh, IT, the technology that people use evolved to, to smartphones as well, which means uh, that Dell's model doesn't, does not make as much sense to Dell as it used to in the past. But I wonder, Silvio, if it still doesn't make a lot of sense to any other business, maybe even the, the, the business that you were you were telling us about, you know, uh, in dealing with suppliers in a very direct way uh, uh, and with customers also very directly so that you, you build knowledge from that direct interaction. All right. Well, again, uh, uh, I, I don't know, uh, you know who, who had the opportunity to read this paper. I, I, I would definitely recommend them all. Uh, they are readings from the 90s that can still inspire uh, this uh, decade. Uh, and but, but I don't know. I, I'd be interested in other people's views of, uh, of of this paper. Sorry, of this paper. I mean, of uh, Michael Dell's interview. If anyone uh, had the chance of reading that, do we have uh, Andrea? Okay, go on, Andrea. Okay, so uh, what I find the most interesting of this paper, and it was the second time I actually read it, was exactly what you were saying, Alexandre, was the, the, the perspective and the context of uh, a guy who has a very, let's say, sharp, strategic mind talking about something he was seeing as a very um, potent uh, source of innovation. So he was kind of betting on virtual uh, on virtual in integration before it was even a thing. So I think it was very nice. And two other things that I really like about this paper, and it has to do with my work, is uh, about the importance that he gives to forecasting. Uh, 
and mm -hmm. I think it's very interesting. And also on putting the the customer in the center of the whole process of of innovation, and putting like his managers and uh, people from the board in touch with the the final customer. I think this is very very nice and very inspiring mm -hmm. because it works. It's been working and it still works. You know, Andrea, uh, when you say, yeah, and he definitely, he mentions a lot the the forecasting that uh, Dell used to do. Of course, we are, we are here discussing uh, Michael Dell's reports on uh, on what Dell used to do in 1998, right? Yes. But, uh, he, he mentions uh, and, and he talks about about forecasting. But at the same time, you notice that he ha he needs to forecast much less than uh, the competition. I, I, I remember that there are parts of, of the text in which he says, you know, while other, while some of the the competitors uh, had a, a uh, how do you call uh, giro turn 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 uh, turn turnover turn turnover is uh, human resources yeah it? no it's not turnover turn uh, anyway uh, while there there the, the other uh, uh, competitors in the market uh, uh, well took let's say several weeks to to since the time that they they built a, 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 a computer until it was sold. Uh, yeah. Dell had almost a negative turn in that way because, of course, people bought um, the, the the computer before the 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 computer was not on a, on on, a, on the shelf of a retailer. The computer was not even manufactured or not or at least not even assembled uh, when the customer already paid for it. So it, it, uh, the company did not get this. Uh, I can't remember the, the the term now in English, uh, but anyway, in, in Portuguese and in English, uh, in Spanish, I believe it's uh, giro or hero. Uh, cash flow, Caroline. Cash flow. It's not not exactly cash flow, I think, Caroline. But anyway, you understood what I what, what I mean here. It was not yeah. negative because, of course, Dell only sold computers, uh, only only delivered computers that had already been sold. So he did not have to forecast what to build, right? But he still the company still had to forecast what to buy in terms of memory, um, processors, well, the, the cases for the computers and everything. That uh, for, in, in that case. I mean, uh, he, he could not order those things only after the customer bought the, com the, the computer, right? Uh, even today, uh, memory, for example, uh, and, and processors are, are, are parts or are components that have to be bought six months, sometimes a year ahead by the manufacturers, uh, by, uh, sorry, by the, the assemblers from the manufacturers because, um, and, and that, needs, that needs a lot of forecasting. But they, they, they need to forecast much less because there's a lot of what they do that is already based on sales that have already actually happened while their competitors uh, had to still guess how much they would sell and based on that then guess the amounts of parts and components that, that they needed to, to, to buy as well. I also like when, when he says um, that uh, a very important uh, feature for a manager is to be aware of the shifts in cul in culture. I think it was brilliant. I love it. Mm -hmm. uh, to be aware not only of what's happening in, in his industry or in, in the company he's working at, but in, in culture, in society as a whole, and be aware of how those shifts impact on the product that he's selling and on the money that the company gets, ultimately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Silvio was mentioning there in the chat that he, uh, in 2000, he, he bought a computer by Itau Tech. Uh, uh, it, which was a Brazilian company then, and that is. Do you remember that? No, Alexander. Alexander. Uh, do you remember yeah, Taltec? No. I do. Uh, in fact, and, and I think well before Taltec, I remember Cobra and 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 others. Uh, I think that Taltec already came in a difficult time, possibly. Uh, so it, it was a company that that had to struggle with the problem that it did not have all the advantages that previous companies in Brazil had of what we call a, a market reserve for for those in other countries. Uh, the Brazilian government. Uh, uh, had a spe special law for for informatics uh, that uh, that only allowed the products manufactured in Brazil to be sold in the country, and that went until the mid '90s, I think. Uh, uh, and so, Italtech was a company that happened after that. So it struggled with uh, the the fact that it had a lot, already some international competition. I think it still had some benefits. Uh, but and and what Silvio is claiming there is that uh, it used a, a completely different. Uh, model to, to, to Dell. I remember, for example, IBM. IBM used to have retail uh, uh, shops. Here in Brazil, they were called IVIX. I don't know if that was a name that they, they used in the whole uh, um, world, but here in Brazil, uh, I think it was IVIX. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I think it was. Uh, I even remember that one of my colleagues uh, uh, at university, uh, who was um, um, who was the founder of uh, Bematec, uh, you, some of you probably know Bematec for the, the little printers that 
uh, were used in all automa uh, auto automation of banking in Brazil. So Bematec became really big. But at the beginning, when, when Bematec was still growing, I think they were making their first millions, he invested, uh, this friend of mine, he invested in, in one of these EVIX shops. It was a, a brand owned by IBM, for, but, but they, 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 they had it as a franchise. You would uh, buy the, the, the possibility of having in your city um, a store. And again, I'm, I'm not sure if EVIX is the name. If anyone remembers that, please tell me. But, but anyway, they had a, the, the logic was uh, computers were sold through a retail shop. And when you, when you sell a computer through a retail shop, you are disregarding the possibilities of this asset, of, of a, a clever asset configuration allowed by information technology. And you're also uh, uh, denying the possibilities of customer interaction to, to, to perform dy dynamic customization. You're saying, you're going to buy whatever I tell you, right? Uh, I have these three models here, you have to choose among them. Uh, of course, there is a, you destroy value proposition compared to Dell uh, in that case. Uh, uh, and, and if you do that. All right, uh, any other comments, impressions, ideas? If uh, not, I would like to uh, just quickly advertise you next week's uh, talk, which is going to be with Professor Elaine Tavares from Copiadi uh, at the Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro. Uh, it's going to be on digitalization and other trends for business education. Uh, she has done some research during the pandemic, uh, and uh, it's probably something that we are all speculating about. Uh, being students or professors here, uh, we are all going back to some normal after or, or whatever normal uh, in a future that uh, is very close. I mean, some of, some of us are already teaching face to face again. Uh, some of us will do that next semester. And uh, the thing is, will it be the same? Well, hopefully not. Hopefully we've learned a lot of things and hopefully we will be able to do a lot of, a lot of things differently. And, uh, and this is actually one of the things that we can do. Right? This, uh, uh, this kind of seminars is something that if I had uh, a vision for 20 years from now, I would say that what we are doing now should be at least uh, uh, an, important part, an important part of what will be uh, academic discussion in the future. It's, it's difficult otherwise for us to have you know, so many uh, professors together. Notice that we are, we are now in a small group here we, right now, but we still have some six or seven professors, students, people from different parts of the world all together. Uh, and this is definitely much more enriching uh, then going back to those classes in which each of us uh, talks about all topics, when we know that Aurora and, uh, and, and Marie are our specialists in smart cities and in, and in governments, uh, we know that Renata Araujo can bring us the perspective of uh, people who are studying uh, information systems in computer science schools. Uh, we have the privilege of having someone as Nicolau Reinhardt uh, uh, here uh, with us today. He's quiet, but and I will not provoke him. Uh, but 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 it's it's great to know that that, that he's around, uh, uh, and, and 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 so many other uh, uh, you know people that can bring their collective intelligence. So that each time we have someone talking about a topic, you know, I talked about this topic today because it's the topic that I enjoy and that that I believe that I know best. But it's great to be able to to hear our colleagues from other universities talking about the topics that they know best. And that way we can have a spectacular information systems course in which each day we have a specialist talking to us about the things that they really know. That will, that will be my notion of collective intelligence for education in, in, in the future. Uh, oh, Nicolau, please say something to us. Uh, your mic. I think you're muted, you're muted. It's better now, right? It is. Okay. Well, uh, congratulations uh, to, to Professor Grebel for this seminar. Very, uh, very focused and very clear and very good examples. So it's very inspiring. And I, I hope it, uh, it really uh, inspires all of you to, to read the papers he mentioned and uh, to follow on the, the lines of research he has, he has mentioned. Now, let, let, let me give you some, some hints for the next week's seminar. Professor Laini Tavares is uh, certainly an authority on the subject, but uh, I would like also to mention to you Professor uh, Adriana Bax Doronha Viana from the University of São Paulo. She is uh, she is a full professor at uh, the business school, and she is also an ass uh, assistant to the, the the president of the university, uh, organizing courses in teaching 
and helping professors of the university to adopt and to, to effective use of new uh, uh, technologies for learning. So uh, if, if you want to, 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 to get some additional ideas for this next week's seminar, uh, to take a look at the sites, uh, you, you see a lot of uh, publications from her, Professora Adriana Vax Noronha Viana. Okay, Not so uh, 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 it might help you to, to, to make the, the next week's seminar more lively and, and more useful. Yeah, maybe, maybe let's, let's talk to well, Elaine is not here with us right now, but yeah, let's <laughs> let's try with uh, to talk to, to both of them and maybe we can arrange that. Yeah, thank you very okay. much. Okay, well, okay, and congratulations, and I hope to see you next week as well. Thank you very much, uh, Nicolau. Yeah, okay. we, we, when, whenever you wish to come, you're more than welcome. You know, you're you're yeah. you and and some of the guys who started this are an inspiration for all of us, and it's great to know yeah. that you're 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 around. By the way, when, when did you use Bitnet for the first time, Nicolau? Did you use Bitnet? Uh, yes, you were in I business think... school, right? Oh yes, uh, I, I had the first uh, the first microcomputer at our school, and I was the first user of Bitnet uh, in our school to get, together with Professor Eduardo Morgado, who is now at the State University of of São Paulo in Bauru. So so we did this, uh, and it, it was very very interesting being a pioneer uh, in this area. Okay. Do you remember the year or about? Uh, Fifteen sixty one, something like this. Shortly after the after Pedro Alvarez Cabral arrived in Brazil. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll investigate that, and, and we'll, we'll we'll tell people when it was the first time that Nicolau used his Bitnet uh, uh -huh. connection there at USB uh -huh. in in Brazil. I think yeah. that we had someone else with uh, their hands up. Uh, was uh, Renata? Yes. Let me just compliment uh, uh, your idea of. Uh, of enticing professors from Copiadi to, to, to present seminars. That's a very good idea. And you have another professor from Copiadi uh, uh, now in our audience, and she is a specialist in very interesting, important themes. So you could maybe get her to present a, a seminar as well. Oh, that, you're talking about Mahima Kadar, but she, she, she's one of the organizers <laughs> already. <laughs> OK, great. Okay, I will promise to invite you, Nicola, when I, I will be in charge of that. Okay, great. Okay, well, okay, I, I'm sorry, I, I have to leave because I have an interview with candidates. So, so we may be meeting next time. Okay, good luck to all of you. Okay, thank you. Bye. 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 Okay, hi everybody. Uh, Alexandre, thank you very much for your talk. It was very nice for me to, to learn a little bit about collective intelligence and to and to know about these papers that I've never read as a person from computer science, sorry. <laughs> so it was very good to, to know the papers. My question is, it's a kind of tips, you know, if you can give me some tips about, uh, can we think about collective intelligence from the point of view of uh, the suppliers, you know? I've been, I've been following the, the open source development movement and today we have the crowdsourcing development movement too, mm. uh, and uh, innovation labs and so on. Do you believe that all these kind of uh, initiatives can be, uh, uh, how can I say, framed into collective intelligence too? You know, you know, collective intelligence is such a large basket that I would say mm -hmm. yes, definitely all of those are expressions of collective intelligence uh, in, in different ways. And different authors uh, sometimes, some of them are more rigorous of. Uh, and some of them think that we should only call, for example, collective intelligence when it's collective intelligence for the collective good. So, for example, crowdsourcing for for those uh, authors, they would say, well, that's that that may even be a spec, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, a use of cheap labor. So uh, there is, you know, there are people that depending on on, on your um, again depending on the lenses that you put in front of your eyes, you look to, to some of the of some some of the parts of the collective intelligence that would make people very enthous enthusiastic about. Others will say, well, I don't know, that seems that uh, you're going to get cheap labor, you, you're, you're going to, in, instead of having your research and development uh, personnel, you will just hire someone just for a task. Uh, so, but, but again, uh, there are different, uh, collective intelligence is not well settled as a, uh, as a, a term that has only one meaning. Uh, I would say, I, I definitely, I consider crowdsourcing, uh, I even consider, uh, um, how do you say, um, uh, when, you, when you're collecting money from people, it's, not, uh, it's a specific kind crowdfunding. of crowdfunding. crowdfunding. For, for me, even yeah. crowdfunding, I would say it's still collective intelligence because I don't think that intelligence is only something that happens uh, in, uh, in the brains. It may also happen with muscles. So you have a lot of uh, collective initiatives or, or initiatives. It's collective intelligence is seen in a very broad way. And 
crowdsourcing uh, uh, and, and even uh, when I said crowdfunding could also be considered collective intelligence because we, we, we can think very broadly in collective intelligence as ways in which we as individual humans help big things happen. So if we put our if we put our brains to work and help a, a collective project, that's collective intelligence. If we put our muscles to work uh, to help a collective project to happen, that, that can also be uh, considered at least by some, as collective intelligence. I prefer to have everything in the same basket. And even if you put your money, your, your, your hands in your pockets and you pay, you help funding a, a, a project, that also means that you value that. That from your perspective, that is something important. And therefore, you're putting uh, your individual intelligence into building a collective uh, thing. But there, there, there are several different ways of, uh, uh, several different taxonomies there. Uh, and, and, and some will be more strict than others. Uh, I, I hope, uh, I, and, and you will see that uh, different people will use different, uh, let's say, concepts in their research. I prefer to be very broad uh, in it and, and, of course, explain when I'm starting to, to develop a specific paper, explain what perspective I'm, I'm using in that case. Okay, thank you. No worries. Well, sorry about that. I think we're, we're getting, uh, uh, I mean, we've, we've gone uh, very far here today. We had a, a smaller crowds than usual. Maybe it's because I didn't advertise it. I, I thought it was it was my my day of presenting, so I didn't go to you know. Sometimes it's important that we go there to the the the, the social networks and bring, remind people of uh, of that day's uh, event. Um, but I, I thank you very much for being here. I thank you very much for sharing your collective intelligence with me. Some good interesting ideas there. Uh, and uh, again, hope to see you all next week for Elaine's presentation. Okay. Okay. Bye. 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 Sandri, thank you for, for, for this presentation. It was yeah, very thank nice. you, Sandri. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.